Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. We had such a fun and energetic conversation with our guest today, Tina McDermott. Tina is a chef and a coach and works with clients in all aspects of their mental and physical health, as well as teaching cooking classes in person and online. She calls herself the lazy inspirational chef and suggests that anyone can make delicious food easily. Tina's health coaching business has a great breadth to it. She's been at it for a long time, and it's grown to include cooking classes, weight loss coaching, corporate wellness, speaking events, and more. This is what we love to see and learn about. These are the kinds of brains we love to pick. A seasoned veteran in the health coaching field who has slowly over time chipped away at building an empire. We love to see who's listening out there, so take a screen grab of your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at healthcoachradio. And the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes can always be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. So check those out. At Health Coach Radio, we're all about raising the voices of practicing health fitness and nutrition coaches and helping to drive this exploding industry forward. That is why we started the podcast. Our show is proudly brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute, an approved educational provider with the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. So our graduates can become eligible to sit for the NBHWC credentialing exam to become a board certified health and wellness coach. And so far we have a 100% pass rate for the board exam. Our fall semester is off and running and we're currently enrolling students for our spring 2022 cohort, which starts in February. At the end of the show, Laura will talk a bit more about our advanced coaching course that will deliver you to coaching mastery and satisfy the educational requirements to sit for that board exam. And you can always learn more at primalhealthcoach.com slash level two. It is time to dive into this incredibly fun and, as I mentioned earlier, super energetic talk with our guest, Tina McDermott. Today we have Tina McDermott. I'm so excited to talk to another fellow coach. We, these are our favorite, favorite conversations. We love to hear stories about how people got started, how other people are coaching, what people are finding success with, and you found quite a bit of success. So I would love to start our conversation as always, a little bit about who Tina McDermott is and how you got here. Would you give us a little bit of a backstory? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Lauren, uh, Elara, and Aaron. And thank you. Uh, yeah. So I, I have to tell you, I'm going to be transparent. I'm, I just might cry. I just might cry. And I'm going to try not to. Uh, but no, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to be me. Uh, my, my name's Tina McDermott. <laughs> I call myself the lazy, inspirational chef. I'm a speaker. I'm a weight loss coach. And, and how did I get there? How did I get there? Well, it all started when I was a kid and I was anorexic. I didn't know I was anorexic. I just, just controlled my parents through not eating. They were Italian off the boat immigrants and gosh, if their children don't eat, that's the worst thing in the world. And it just made me happy because I can control them, you know, and that unfortunately turned in, started my emotional eating. And when I was 12 or 13, I went to Italy with my grandmother and I gained 20 pounds. When I came back, my sisters teased me all the time that I gained so much weight and they called me fat. I had to, I had two older sisters and you know, that, that just is really challenging for a 13, 14 year old, if you can just imagine, but then it got worse from there. It got worse because I ended up having a lot of digestive issues, gas and bloating, and I'm talking embarrassing gas. And this isn't even the piece that I'm just gonna make me cry. That, you know, my sisters would call me a nickname in Italian. They were just loving to me and they would call me a nickname. It was puzza, and which means stinky in Italian. Mm-hmm. Because I just had a an never ending gas. It was terrible. And no one knew what it was. Ultimately, it was because I had Lyme disease, which really didn't get discovered until I was in my 30s. And I know I likely had it in my teenage years. So that kind of started my journey of the emotional 
roller coaster that, you know, you have to exercise all the time. You have to eat right. Turned me into a vegetarian, which I'm not against vegetarianism, but it's not for me. Uh, and I found that out some 10 years later. When I was around 19, my sister at 23, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, which drove me to learn as much as I possibly can about health and wellness. And I read every book that I could. That's actually when I turned vegetarian at the age of 19, because, you know, you read all of these books and you just like, okay, I don't want to get cancer myself. I don't want to suffer like she did. I don't want to have my boobs cut off. And, you know, she went in two years later to get reconstructive surgery. She almost died from an infection and it was just terrible. So I was a travel agent at the time and, but I still was so interested in nutrition. So I've always was reading books and studying about it and riding my bike as much as possible. So anyhow, fast forward, she did pass away at the age of 48, which I am, I'm sorry, five years her, her senior. Uh, no, I don't think that's the correct way of saying it. I have outlived her by five days, five yeah. years. Yeah. And she is my love. She is my inspiration. She is who I dedicate my business to. And yeah, so she is the reason why I do what I do. She is the reason why I do what I do. So that is like the short of the very long of it. And I don't want to keep going on and on because... <sighs> Well, I think a story like that resonates with so many people that go to health coaching, especially from another career, right? You said you were a travel agent for yeah. a while, but, and I was in finance and Aaron was in advertising. So all three of us here have made our way to health coaching, health, wellness, fitness from an entirely different career and probably educational path because yeah. we've had our own sort of passion story, right? Whether it was our own health or in uh, it, which it sounds like that's the case with you as well, but really the impetus being your sister and how that just comes from someplace really deep within, you know, and it's something we talk about with our clients that not our clients, our students at the school that Aaron and I work for when they're having feelings of um, just self-doubt right? An imposter syndrome. Like, oh. I know I really want to do this, but, but who am I? You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a this. I'm just someone who wants to help other people. And what we keep trying to drive home is how important that little piece is inside of you, that nugget there and how much good that can do. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be an expert. As a matter of fact, that's the opposite of coaching. Yeah. You know, so, so thank you for sharing that. And, and I think there's a lot of people listening that are going to resonate with the fact that their passion and their drive and their interest in doing this comes from something similar. And that, I think that's super relatable. Yeah. And, and thank you for that, Laura, because there's so many people in this world who have that imposter syndrome and it took me a while to get over that. And I realized through coaching, because I get coached myself for you know my, my business coaching, I get coaching myself. And I've learned that there's so many other coaches out there, but there's nobody who is Tina McDermott. There's mm -hmm. nobody who has my life experience and my passion for doing what I do. And there's people who are going to be attracted to me and that's phenomenal. And then there's people who are not, and that's all good. And the more health coaches that we have in this world, the better this world will be because different people are going to be attracted to different people. So for people who have that imposter syndrome, stand up for yourself because you deserve to do what you do. And there's people out there who need you. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of brings to mind the question like, who are you, who do you think you're impersonating? Like we're imposter syndrome. Who are you impersonating? You're just, you're just putting yourself out there in a way that's um, in integrity uh, of, you know, integrity of what, uh, to what you believe in and how you do life. And it's like, there, there's no, there's no imposter syndrome because you're not impersonating anyone. You're just doing you. Yeah. So good, good. Pep talk. Yeah. I I'm, I'm really curious at the very top of your story. You said, I call myself the lazy inspirational chef. Yes, I wrote that down too. <laughs> what does that mean? Hilarious. Um, okay, so I'm a hungry girl. I don't have time 
to make food all of the time. <laughs> and I take a lot of shortcuts and you know, I'm hungry and I don't have time. And you know, I, I, my, my husband and I were both cyclists and during the week, like tonight, we're going to go on a 6 PM ride. We won't be home until eight 30 at night. I need some fast food. Okay. And I teach people the shortcuts to get fast food in their refrigerator so that when they get home and they're starving, feed me now, you just burned 3000 calories and you need to eat and you don't want to be reaching for what's simple, the chips or the hot dogs or something that's like, okay, just heat it up and let's get going. You plan ahead of time. You spend just a little bit of time in the kitchen and you reach in your fridge and you have fast food. For example, in my fridge now, I have salads in a jar. I got a rotisserie mm -hmm. chicken. I pulled the whole thing apart, threw out the bones, and I put my homemade Italian salad dressing on the bottom of all of the jars. Super simple. You throw in marinatable vegetables, right? What are marinatable vegetables? Mm -hmm. Carrots, celery. Peppers, what did you find at the market that was beautiful? Zucchini, I found zucchini. I throw those in there, throw olives in there, tomatoes. Then I put the chicken in. And then at the top, I stuff as much lettuce as I possibly can. I work from home. You'd think it would be easy for me to reach in my fridge and put the salad together. It's deterring to have to go in the fridge and reach for 10 different things. Now I reach in the fridge, I grab my mason jar, I pour it in a bowl and I have my salad. And it's portable. So if I don't, if I'm traveling, if I have to go someplace, no excuses. I grab my jar and I eat right out of the jar with a fork and I shake it up with the dressing on the bottom. You shake it up, get the dressing everywhere. And it's a little messy eating out of the jar, but it's fun. So, so that's why I mean lazy. And, 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 and I'll, I'll give you one more thing. In culinary school, they teach you that consistency of cut, everything has to be the same size when you're making food. And I just call bullocks on that. I, it's too much. I don't have time for that. So mm -hmm. I get my mandolin out and I use my mandolin. Everything is all different sizes. I really don't care. I use an instant pot all the time. I use my cast iron skillet. I teach them the shortcuts to clean those things, the shortcuts to cutting an onion and not cutting your fingers. Ah, so that's the lazy part. Oh, yeah. The inspirational part is we have a recipe and we're like, oh my gosh, we need this. We need that. Oh, I don't have rosemary. Darn it. I can't make that recipe. Are you kidding me? Use whatever you have. Go to the market and buy whatever vegetables you want and then cook those. And, and you can follow, say a recipe calls for, uh, I can't even think right now, something that, that you might not have. Well, maybe that's not the right recipe, but you don't have to follow a recipe to the T is my bottom is the bottom yeah. line. If I'm making a, a chicken vegetable soup and you're a vegetarian, get rid of the chicken, but make the soup. Okay. There are so many workarounds to in, in be inspired. If you don't like eggplant, don't use eggplant, use zucchini, I, use something right. different. So that's the inspirational piece. Use the flavors that you, that you love. Like my Mexican soup. You don't like Mexican flavors, put Italian flavors in there. <laughs> You know, it, my, my job is to help people find joy in the kitchen, even if they don't know or like to cook, find joy in the kitchen. I love, love it. it. Okay. So love that because I'll be really honest with you. And I kind of was scrolling through your bio a little bit and I was like, oh man, Tina's a chef. Um, I was like, here's, here's my take on this. Um, regular folk like us who didn't go to culinary school, maybe we've been told, I don't, my mom always used to joke with me. Oh, Aaron doesn't know how to cook. Aaron, Aaron doesn't like to be in the kitchen. And it's like, well, I, I mean, I'm a child. Of course I don't like being in the kitchen. Like my, as a child, my mom would say this, but I like grew up with that story. Like, Oh, I just don't really know how to make food. And honestly, one day I just started trying, <laughs> like just putting together meals that I liked with ingredients that I liked and didn't, I didn't make, you know, and I uh, guess what? It's not that hard. It's actually not that hard. So I think that I think that sometimes people um, get overwhelmed by this idea, two ideas. First of all, recipes. I always get clients saying, I need recipes. And I'm like, I don't think you do need recipes. I think you need just basic cooking skills. Like, I just think if you knew how to cook a chicken in the oven, like that's not even a recipe. That's just a cooking skill. People think they need re recipes and they also think they need meal prep. And so it's kind of like, 
I'm, I always work with my clients to solve that. And it sounds like you do too. And you, you kind of like, you kind of like taken off your chef's hat and said, this is, this is real life. This is really how people have to engage with food. Um, like for example, one of my favorite meal prep tips I give my clients is just thaw meat twice a week. <laughs> like Then you have thawed meat in the fridge and you can cook it. And then it doesn't take that long. Right. Um, I just think that this is a huge knowledge gap for clients. Mm -hmm. Like I can't cook, so I'm not going to bother trying. It's like, you probably can. Um, so I just really like that somebody like yourself, who's been to culinary school and is a, is a trained chef is saying, forget all that. It, let's, let's keep it very simple and totally gettable. Very nice. So true, Erin. I don't, I mean, we, you and I've talked about this, how many people are like, well, I don't, I don't know how to cook a steak, so I don't eat steak, or I don't know how to cook fish. So I don't eat fish. And, um, you know, it's amazing to me if what you can do with just some salt, pepper, and butter, like magic happens, right? It's just so simple. Um, and people are so afraid of it. So I love that you're leading with this sort of skills in the kitchen. I mean, look, yeah. don't get me wrong. There's definitely times where my husband's like, I really have a taste for insert whatever, which yeah. is a departure <laughs> from our protein plus veggie plus healthy fats and spices equals meal paradigm mm -hmm. that we live day to day, you know, but if it occasionally he's like, you know what, I kind of have a hankering for whatever, where then I will say, okay, and this is where the inspiration comes from. Let's say it's lasagna. You know, how can I find a way to make a healthier version of that that's full of vegetables, that is not going to be just laden with a bunch of gluten and this, that, and the other thing that he can, that's sort of lasagna-esque and hits that spot for him. You know, but this comes from, again, to Aaron's point, just getting in there and tossing things around and kind of yeah. figuring out what things taste good together and what can I use to replace whatever. And you, you give things a try. I love yeah. that you empower your clients with, with things like that. So you were, you were saying that a lot of what you're doing, you're doing it from the kitchen these days. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times I'll even do my interviews and podcasts right from the kitchen, but I just wasn't sure about today, but yeah, I'm right from my own kitchen. And I designed my own kitchen, not necessarily for the cooking classes, you know, cause I redid my own kitchen about 10 years ago and it is perfect. The whole layout is perfect to do cooking classes other than my stove is over here. So, but I bring a little burner to my countertop. Oh my gosh. I love it. It is so much fun. It's so much fun. Yeah. And I don't so, have to lug heavy with boxes. You. Oh, sorry. I, I was saying I, um, I don't have to lug heavy back heavy boxes to my corporations. I can do it right here from my house. So sorry. Right. Sorry. Yeah. That's what we were going to get into because because the cooking classes that you run, you had been working, you had been working in corporate, I guess we'll call it corporate wellness. You've been yeah. going to offices. Now corporate wellness is a, is a branch of health coaching that people are really interested in. Um, you know, I think when health coaches think about corporate wellness, I think they're going to go in and do nutritional consults and whatnot, but you were going in and doing cooking classes in corporations. Like, tell us about yeah. that. Well, it morphed from doing my nutrition courses. Cause I think in one nutrition lecture, people aren't going to get anything other than that, uh, like inspiration for a day. Uh, but my courses were eight weeks long and I started incorporating one of the classes as a cooking class. And then people started calling me to do cooking classes, just cooking classes. I'm like, okay. And what I found when I, and I also did uh, do like six weeks, six week cooking courses. I would do those as well. And what I found, what I found is that when you cook with them, you put aprons on people, you call them up and you have them work with you. They get it. It's that kinesthetic part of learning that really brings home oh wow this is what a carrot is like this is what it's like to chop a carrot this is what it's like to peel onion or peel garlic this is fun this is good I can do it so that's what I found that um, it really transformed people quicker yeah. than just my interactive coaching courses and or classes yeah, yeah. so I and, love and it probably quicker than just giving out recipes too I know I'm, com I'm coming down hard on recipes and I know I am, but it's like, I just don't think a recipe ever solves someone's like health problems. <laughs> it's, an excuse. it's an excuse. And that's what I have found through my, my, my coaching as well. Oh, I can't get, I can't download those recipes. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll let me help you out. Let me figure out how to help you download the recipes and let's peruse through them. Let's see what, what inspires you. 
And the basics are always the basics. What are they? Your vegetables, eat as many as you can, get a little bit of protein, really good, clean protein, every single meal, some really good fats in every single meal. You put them together. What do you love? What's fresh at the market? You don't need the recipe. You just need, I love what you said, the skills. I even wrote it down. And you don't even need the prep. You need to, to just set yourself up for success in the kitchen. Yeah. I did a little, I mean, I, I don't, I did a little cooking demo in my group program. Um, literally like I call it a cooking demo. It's just like, here's how I make some of the food that is a staple in my fridge. Here's how I make my chicken salad. I like totally pull apart a rotisserie chicken. Those things are gold. Um, you know, even little things I I'd showed my, my people, how I do these slow barbecued ribs, because that's a set it and forget it. Like I can put the ribs on in the middle of the day, work, you know, a couple, three hours. And I was like, Oh, it's supper time. And it's like, Oh, they're ready. Nice. I don't have to do anything. Oh, my love even, I know even, okay. And this is going to be uncomfortable for anybody who's kind of plant-based listing, but you know, that silver skin on the back of the ribs, Yeah, you got to mm-hmm. pull that skin off. And yeah. I showed them how to do that. And they're like, Oh, Oh, you, that's how you, that's how you get rid of that gross skin on the back. That's why I don't like eating pork ribs. It's like, Oh yeah. Little things, little cooking skills. And, and but, but like nobody taught you no like this like anything why would you expect to be good in the kitchen why would you expect to know how to put together great supportive meals nobody showed you so just honestly try you know yeah that's so funny Aaron because I'm lazy I don't take the silver skin off I don't <laughs> I'm lazy I don't have time for that and I don't care okay. <laughs> but I love ribs I love them love them love them I wrap them I put the I, you know I, I have to tell you this I have to say this I'm Italian, so I love garlic and rosemary and salt and pepper. That Those are my favorite flavors together. And most people do barbecue seasonings on ribs. I do garlic and rosemary and olive oil and salt and pepper on my ribs. Anytime I have anyone come to the house or I bring them to, to, to a dinner, they're like, holy cow, these are the best ribs I've ever had. Think outside the box. If you like Mexican spices, use those on your ribs. If you want Italian spices, use those on your ribs. But I'm telling you, nothing beats the fresh garlic, rosemary, salt, and pepper, freshly cracked and good olive oil. Wrap it up in tin foil in the oven, three hours, done. Forget about the silverback. I don't know. I'm, I'm lazy. I don't have time for that. <laughs> well, and you know, I think at the end of the day too, you know what, what kind of tastes good. I'm Italian as well. My father's... Oh, yeah. um, I guess a hundred percent Italian, whatever, like his, like that was his, um, his background, his ethnicity when my mom, I'm a mutt, but my father's side of the family was the Italian side of the family. And my grandmother passed away relatively recently at like 95 years old. She lived a very long, very fruitful life. And she was a phenomenal cook and her mother taught her and her mother's mother taught, you know, her grandmother taught her mother the whole nine yards. And as a Christmas gift, last Christmas, my cousin got her hands on my grandma's like recipe index cards and she put them all together in a cookbook for us. Right. Which I love. And you look through the cookbook and it's all desserts and baked goods. And the reason is because the savory stuff she didn't need a recipe for. Wow. Right. The savory stuff she just knew to your point, really good olive oil, fresh garlic, salt, pepper, some rosemary, maybe some basil. Right. Um, and she used mostly kind of those same flavors and just about everything she did on the savory side. It, it was the baked goods. It's baking where you need to be kind of more precise and, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, I get, I have this recipe book that is now, you know, it's like a keepsake for me, but 95% uh-huh. of the stuff in there, I'm not going to make because I don't eat that stuff anymore, but occasionally oh. I will, like, it'll be a Christmas thing, you know, well, we'll make some struthily one Christmas or, you know, some of those just classic Italian desserts or whatever, and we'll do it once a year. But uh, it was funny when I was looking at that, I'm like, it's amazing to me. I know that she cooked more than this. <laughs> I remember eating with her and it was my aunt saying it's because that other stuff that savory, she, she knew that already. It didn't, she used so many of the same things. And so, um, you know, to your point, I, I just think being able, so here's one of my favorite things too, is just like an egg bake. It's basically like a quiche without the crust. Uh Talk about being able to put a million different flavors in something like that. Like everything goes with eggs right? I can make an Italian one. I can make more of a Mexican one. I can do just like a ham one. I can do most Mm -hmm. all veggies, like you name it. And every single week I can meal prep that 
meal prep, I've got an air quotes, not that you can see me, but make it at the start of the week. It lasts me all week and it tastes different. And week to week, it's, it's different. So it's like these little things to your point, like, I, th- I think where recipes come in for people is more like it's a bridge. It's a little bit of a crutch for now that from there they can take a basic recipe and learn to manipulate it and find alternatives within there. But, you know, I agree with you. People tend to, they can kind of use it as an excuse, but I will say when I first started my blog, it, they were by far my most popular posts. The recipe ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like recipes. I have recipe books that I've created that I give to my clients. Mm-hmm. And I find that, hey, did you look in the recipe book? Tina, I need a recipe. Did you look in the book? They don't <laughs> I don't, did you look in the book? Did you look in the book? You know, anyhow, I don't, whatever. Oh my gosh. I, yeah. I think that the, 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 the world is so uh, electronic now. And if we want a recipe, we just go right to Google yeah. for the recipe. Mm-hmm. It's right, so much right. easier. And it, you know, even for me, I'm like, oh gosh, how long am I supposed to cook the vegetable soup in the instant pot? And I just Google it and it's, oh, it's four minutes. Okay, good. Uh, so it's just so electronic these days that people aren't looking at hardcover. I'm even going through all of my books on my bookshelf and I've got all of these recipe books. I've got all of these health books. I'm like, oh, these are all electronic. Should I keep them? I haven't answered that one yet. I like my hard on my hard copy. What oh, happened? I love books. Yeah. I, you know what? I was thinking back to um, my cooking demo that I did. And I absolutely agree with you. Like the internet has 80 trillion recipes. Uh, you yeah. don't need me to give them to you. Mm-hmm. You can Google, Google whatever meat you like or whatever vegetable you have I in the like fridge one. and you'll find a hundred thousand recipes. Yeah. Um, the, I think the one thing that I, I suggested to my clients during that group cooking demo thing was like, you know what I think is a really useful thing to have is a meat thermometer. That's probably the only thing I would say, go get one because people don't know how to cook meat. They're scared to cook meat. (laughs) Like, and and for me, you know, protein is a really important part of kind of how I coach people and they're scared to do it. It's like, just go get a meat thermometer. The one I have actually has, it has like, it has a pork, it says pork, it says poultry. It says, you know, it it has the names of the meat on the thing. It doesn't doesn't even know the temperature. It's just, yep, it's (laughs) pointing at pork. So we're good. Um, To me, that's the one gadget that, you know, just go get and kind of go analog with that or figure that out or even Google that literally Google when is chicken cooked? What, at what temperature is chicken safe to eat? And, you know, you're good to go. And that kind of quells their concerns, but the internet, yeah, what a miracle. Yeah. yeah. Meat thermometer and good knife. Instant read, an instant read uh, thermometer is what I use an instant read thermometer. I love it. And I use that often in my shows and I teach people that really, yeah, really good point. And the other thing I like to teach in my shows are, um, knife skills. Laura, you were just talking about a really good knife. I teach them how to hold the knife. I teach them what kind of knife is the best kind of knife, the one that you like mm-hmm. and a sharp knife. Yeah. You have to get your knives sharpened at least once or twice a year. I'm very fortunate. My dad is a barber and he loves to sharpen knives. So he has his own little knife sharpener for his scissors and his blades. So twice a year, I bring my knives up to my dad, dad's knife sharpening time. And he just sits there and he sharpens all my knives. And, 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 and you have to make sure that you're also using, oh, I can go on and on about knife skills. Like wood is better. Wooden butcher block is better than the plastics. When you store your blades, store them in wood, as opposed to anything else, like set them where that they're not touching other utensils. Don't put it in the dishwasher where they're clanking up against everything. Treat your knives well, and they will treat your fingers well and your hands. I'm 53 and I'm I'm also a cyclist. So I'm, I'm always using my hands, the mountain biking, the road biking. And so my hands get a little tired from chopping and such. So I have a very light stainless steel knife and my heavy knife, I don't tend to use anymore. So use what you like. And also, you know, remember to clamp your fingers in of the other hand so that you don't uh, cut your little pretty beautiful fingers off. Uh, I, I want to ask you for a knife brand recommendation since we're talking about it, because I'm in the market. Uh, you know, uh, Henkel is up there with knife brands that are like the top of the line Henkel. I believe it or not, I have a set of knives from, please don't judge me, from Tupperware. No, 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 no. They're from Tupperware. Mm. They are 
phenomenal. Some of some it's up there. People don't know the name brand, but they're, I don't know if they're Tupperware brand, but I got it from my Tupperware rep many years ago. And they're terrific knives where the tang goes all the way through. The handle is rubber, so it doesn't uh, uh, slip out of your hands. Um, it's got the little bevels in it so that the food doesn't stick to the knife. Phenomenal knife. So if you want not like the Henkel, super expensive. The tools, the ones from Tupperware were probably mid-range. And the, the knife that I love the best, I can't even tell you the name brand of it. It's very lightweight and it's mm -hmm. stainless steel all the way through. Mm -hmm. And it's a hollow handle. So there's no tang. It just goes all the way through and it's super light. And again, don't judge me, but I got this particular knife on a whim when I was at um, one of those big box stores. Like home goods. <laughs> Now, it, yeah, it was BJ's actually. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, let me try it. It's my favorite knife. Oh. It's not even the most expensive knife I have. Okay, see, this is great. This is great because I bought the Henkels. I broke the bank on the, on the big expensive knives. And I was thinking to myself, probably didn't need to do that. You don't need to, right? It's, it goes again to kind of this, this sort of like your lazy inspirational bit. It's like, let's not make the kitchen stuff a big deal. <laughs> it's not, it's not a big deal. You, I mean, you know, if you're really up for like, I want to go full out, go for it. Otherwise get what you like, get what works for your hand, get what, you know, works for you. You don't want a big, heavy knife. Like I, I don't want a big, heavy knife. My hand hurts. I, you know, lots of issues with my hands, but anyhow, yeah, you don't have to go all out. So I find it fascinating that the anorexic kid became a chef. Okay. So you gave us kind of, you gave us a little bit of the story, but clearly there's a lot of missing parts in the beginning part of your story, how you went from, I was anorexic as a kid to having gained weight but, and, and, and that transition to sort of becoming a chef. If I would love to dig into this story a little bit more because I do find hmm. that the relationship with food with my clients, and I, I think Aaron would agree with me, starts young, yeah. very young. And some of it's because we've been taught to use food as reward. Food is a coping mechanism. I heard you say is a way to control. Uh -huh. That comes up sometimes too. Um, you know, so would you mind speaking a little bit to as far, I mean, it could be certainly your story, but also what you find with your clients as far as their relationship with food, how some of this might've manifested at a very young age and how as a coach, you can help clients kind of work through some of that. I'm going to start from the end piece and then work back and ask me other questions if I miss some things. Okay. One of the biggest things that I help my clients with is help them with their emotional eating. Mm -hmm. that is that's people know how to eat they know they know how to lose weight they know how to get they, they might not know how to get healthy but they do know how to lose weight there's and it's that emotional piece that sabotages them yes it's probably something that happened to them when they were a kid who knows and I've been through a lot of therapy in my life for my emotional issues and they always 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 wanted to take me back there and I said to them, I don't want to go back there. And even my sister says to me, Tina, you forget everything, don't you? And I said, maybe that's a good thing. You know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to know those things. And what I've learned uh, through, I've learned lots of different modalities to help people with their emotional eating, uh, you know, emotional freedom technique, uh, a whole bunch of other things. Over the last four years, I have been using a technique that I learned from Christian Michelson. He's one of my uh, coaches that I followed for a long time and I got coached through and it's called the peace process. And this peace process that I use doesn't go back in the past. We don't have to know where those feelings came from. We just have to feel whatever that feeling is. Oh my gosh, I need to eat all of the icing off the chop top of every single cupcake in the world. Let me go drive from bakery to bakery and find them all to I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't need that because you just feel that feeling. And I do this peace process. It's kind of sort of like hypnosis, but I can't call it that. I don't call it that. And it, and it really calms that feeling 
down to where you come to neutral with it and also what I call peace so that you don't have that feeling any longer, not even having to identify where it came from because I don't wanna have to identify where any of my emotional things came from. Although I have that broader story of yes, being anorexic and controlling, I, I don't know where that started and I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I just want to come to peace with it. And I have, mm -hmm. and I teach others to do that. Yeah. Like going to the root of it is more in the realm of probably therapy or counseling. Therapy. Yeah. 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 And even in therapy and counseling, I just never really made too many strides when with the peace process, it just, it just calms you and you come to peace with it. And I've done that not just for food with my clients, but also over other emotional issues, which are really at the crux of their emotional eating, whatever it is going on with um, their mother. I had a client, her mother died last year. And ever since her mother passed away, she was just emotional eating and she wasn't ready for the peace process yet. And then when she was six months later, we did it. And she's like, oh my God, I, I just feel so wonderful. I'm so much I feel so joy, so much peace and love and, and I'm okay. I don't have to stuff all those, that bread in my mouth and that pasta any longer. I'm okay. It was really beautiful to see the transition. So yeah, we don't, we're not therapists. I'm not a therapist. However, I can help you heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've talked to um, several psychologists uh, on this podcast. And, and one, one of the things we hear as a common thread is sort of helping people overcome this isn't necessarily going back in any kind of therapeutic work, but it's just helping the client through letting themselves feel the feeling, right? Sitting with it. I think it was Dr. Joan, what was it like 30 seconds or something, you know, and just help being there with them as they sit through it, right? So that it can dissipate and they can let it go, find peace, right? This is kind of a very common uh, that that we've heard just from from experts that work in this area too. Yeah. So is that kind of a part of that peace process for you? You nailed it. You nailed it. That's it. That's it. You just allow it to just dissipate because we we tend to want to stuff our feelings under the rug. We mm -hmm. want to stuff that we don't want to feel our feelings, and most of our Fears are fears of feelings. We don't want to feel whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And through the peace process, you feel it yeah. in its entirety and you send it acceptance. You surrender, you send it love if you can. And yeah, you just sit with it and it's not for 30 seconds. Sometimes I do it for 10 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes several sessions. Mm -hmm. Most often they resolve within within an hour's session. Most often they resolve within that. And some people with deep rooted takes a couple of sessions. And, and then, you know, I've done it for myself. The peace process with, through my coaches have helped me with money issues. Now talking about entrepreneurship and such, I know I'm jumping here, but mm -mm. you know, I always thought that money was limited and money was scarce and clients were scarce. And, and I've done a lot of peace process. I've done a lot of work on this and you know, clients are abundant. There are so many people out there that need our help. Be open to it and they will come to you. There is so much money in this world. Be open to it and it will come to you. I grew up in, you know, my parents were off the boat Italian. There was always money is scarce, money is scarce. And you have this ingrained in your cells and I let it all go. <laughs> I let it all go. And it feels so different now where spending a hundred dollars now, it was like, is like spending $10 mm -hmm. several years ago. It's, it's just, it's just money. It comes and it goes. It's okay. I have no charge. I call it charges. I have no charge on money whatsoever. Like none. Whereas before it was like, oh my God, I got to pay the bills. Yeah, right. And no, I have nothing. So it goes in all aspects, you know, with the emotional eating and also with the emotional running your business. Mm -hmm. your business. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that we kind of pivoted to this. Um, the money mindset thing as an example, you know, just considering our, our audience. Um, yeah. 
I, I remember years ago first coming across this or having it put into my orbit, this idea of wealth consciousness, you know, and when, when you're kind of in, in the muck of that feeling sort of that scarcity and somebody says, be open to it, there's abundance. You're like, what? <laughs> so I just wanted to say that to anybody listening, who's like, what? <laughs> cause, cause for people who are on the other side of it, um, we can talk about it and know what it feels like to have opened up to more of abundance mindset. But for anybody who's listening, who doesn't really get what this feels like or what it's like, just know that if you are operating from a place of scarcity, um, um, letting go of that, detaching from it, being open to uh, other possibilities is the way to get into an abundance mindset. And it might seem like a completely weird nebulous endpoint, but once you get there, it's really cool. That's my pep talk to anybody who's like confused about what it feels like to have abundance. I think if we talk about it, we'll know what it means, but maybe not everybody mm-hmm. listening. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, yeah. So what, what you're saying is you've applied your peace process to um, which, which you apply, which you apply in your business to like emotional eating and emotions around food. And now you're applying it to, you kind of apply it to everything and it's helped you open, open up to success. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm going to be on a TV show. I mean, I am on a TV show uh, and I said, I'm going to be on TV. And oh, a few wow. months later, there it was, it manifested. You know, I, I, I wrote myself a fake check for so much money and here it is. It's manifesting. Oh, that's the Jim Carrey thing, isn't it? Oh, Jim, oh, Carrey, yeah, Jim Carrey did that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he did that too. Jim, I just watched Jim Carrey movie last night. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah. Jim Carrey wrote himself a check. He did. I missed he, wrote it. It. he wrote himself a check for a million dollars or something, or he wrote mm-hmm. somebody a check. I don't know the story. No, he wrote himself a check. I remember. Yeah. I remember the story. He wrote himself a check and it, yeah, and he manifested it. You did. Yeah. And then we've, we've, we've talked about the concept of manifestation with a few guests on our, on our show. And, um, just, I don't know, I guess the tremendous value of being able to envision what it is you really want yeah. and, and know in your heart that it can happen, that it will happen because it then prompts you to take a step and produce an action and do it repeatedly and consistently till you get there. But if you can't allow yourself to even vision it and believe it can happen, you're kind of dead in the water. You're stuck from day one. Um, and that, it was something that I struggled with early on. And it really wasn't until, um, I don't know, I guess it was when I really was honest with myself of what I valued most money was just a means to an end. I kept searching to make more money because what I really wanted was more time. But Mm -hmm. in my search for more money, I ended up having no time. It was backwards. (laughs) It was backwards. So then, you know, I started really just being much more protective around my time and wanting to spend more time. And this is my goal. And and this is kind of ultimately what I want my life to be. Mm -hmm. What steps do I need to take to get there. And at the end of the day, believing that this is going to happen, I can, I can literally picture myself there. It's going to happen. Okay. So what's my first step? Some of the fear kind of fell away a little bit. Good. I think, you know, I mean, so how did this kind of work for you in in that process? Um, Was there something about the direction you were headed that you weren't satisfied with and wanted a change or t- tell question. us a little bit about that. Yeah. A good, 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 quite really good question. I was a personal, I've been, oh, I still am a personal trainer for many years and I had my own personal training studio and I ran it myself and, and, and wasn't, it's not the easiest thing. And I started to go to, go to these conferences and get coached from Christian Michelson, as I was saying, and I always like to give credit where credit is due. And one of the things he, he said to me was, I ah, get rid of the studio and just do your weight loss coaching. And I'm thinking, how do I do that? Most of my money comes from personal training, but I really want to do weight loss co- online coaching. And then the pandemic happened. And then I Arma. put a train in my studio. And six weeks into not being able to train my studio, I shut it down. I got out of my lease. I got an attorney. I got out of the lease and I just did everything remotely. I did everything from home and it was 
such a huge brick building that came off of my shoulders. The amount of energy that it took me to run the studio, to be at the studio, to wait there in between clients. My life has opened up completely since all of this, this pandemic and that I am 100% at home working here. Do I miss being with people in person? Sometimes, but I get to see you all, you know, I get to go to the grocery store three times a week for my cooking classes, you know, it's wonderful. I know that I am on this planet to affect as many people in this world as possible. And I knew for the longest time that I needed to get rid of my studio Hmm. and I couldn't make myself do it. I was there for eight, nine years and I just couldn't make that step. And I couldn't, I couldn't expand. And, and I, there was always something in me like, Tina, you're not affecting as many people in the world as you can. You only have, you know, you're under 50 clients and there's so many more people in this world. There's, and I knew I needed to get that brick building off my shoulder. And now I have, and I'm able to affect more and more and more people through, of course, being on my, my cooking shows, being on podcasts and I'm, uh, yeah. And I do go to some live events. I've been to a couple of live events and I'm, I'm, I'm fulfilling my mission and I'm feeling so much more. Yes. I'm in the right direction. And it's not because of the money. It was because of this, this feeling in my gut that there's so many people in the world that need to know my story, that need to know that, that you can heal from Lyme, that you can overcome uh, losing a loved one to cancer, that you can overcome gas and bloating, and that you can live a life that's full of love and vibrancy and health and freedom, free from dot, capital D, capital I, capital E with a small T's, free from dis-ease, free from all of that. And that's what I'm able to do now. And having this, that feeling not be like in my face every single day, like, yes, I'm doing this. And, and, and I'm fulfilling my life. That's when the abundance starts to, to has started to come back to come back come to me because I'm doing what my my instincts are telling me to do, what my gut yeah. has been telling me to do. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Yes, um, yes. I would like to know because um, you have a lot of things on the go, right? Cooking shows on TV, your weight loss coach. You know, this is the, this is the most commonly asked question, but I'm just going to ask it. What are your days like? What are your days like? Do you have, do you kind of time block? Do you have your days where you're, you you have the days where you're physically doing cooking demos and then you're cooking. And then do you have, do you set aside time for like business development stuff or do you outsource some stuff like that? How do you do your business? Love this question. Thank you, Aaron. I love this question. One of the things that Christian back to him was telling me, you know, you, you coach people three times a month. And he goes, yeah, I could, I will work three, three months, three weeks out of the month. One week I take off. I have finally gotten there. Those last couple of months, I've been taking one week off a month. Ooh, wow. So yes, I've been taking one week off a month. Doesn't mean I don't look at my emails and stuff. So my coaching clients, I coach them three times a month. My, even my groups are three times a month. I block it. I time block. I have acuity scheduling. So everything is in there. Um, times are open when people, when, when my clients can schedule their coaching. Times are open when my corporate clients can schedule their cooking classes. It's all automated. I have uh, a marketing team and I have a virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. So my marketing team is also encompasses some assistants in there too, plus an assistant. I have outsourced all of the things except for accounting. I'm not ready to give that up, but I've outsourced all of those things that are, um, I don't have time for that. It takes me so much time to do that, that I don't have time for the coaching. I don't have time for the money makers. My, I have valued my time to be so much money an hour. And if I can pay somebody $30 an hour to do that work, why would I do it? All right. So that's what I've done. So now um, everything is in those three weeks. And if you need me during the week that I'm off, I'm on vacation. That's family beach week, uh, you know, at the end of this month, beginning of August. Sorry, I can't do it. I'm full. I don't need any I don't need the work and I do want it. And, and I mean, I want the work when I'm available and this is my life. This is my schedule. And, you know, I, I everything is all color coded in my, in my Google calendar as well. All of the different things are color coded. 
And I look at my calendar the week ahead of time. And I know when I have my cooking classes, I know when I'm, it's wonderful. I love it. It, 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 I can't tell you that it took overnight to, to do this. It was kind of morphed into this, but the acuity scheduling, having a calendar love that tool made it so easy. And now I'm working on my website so that my corporate clients can go in and schedule their own classes without having to schedule time with me and then me do it. Now that they, they're going to have a sizzle reel, they're going to have a description, then they can go right into my schedule, schedule it, get their flyer, get their recipe cards, get everything. And I'm working on automating all of that. So the key is delegate, yeah. let go of stuff yeah. and take control of your life, take control of your calendar and take off when you want to take off. I was taking off only one evening a week to go to, to bicycle. Oh boy. And it rained that night. I wasn't able to go biking. So now I scheduled off two nights a week. You want to, you want to coach with me? You're not coaching those two nights. I'm sorry. And I do not work weekends period. Yeah. No. That that is kind of, that's um in the same, in the same vein as this abundance mindset or like it, it, detaching from the outcome. Like I need all the clients I need to just, my calendar needs to be wide open seven days a week because if the, if a client, what if a client misses me and uh, yep. it's a real power move. It, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's empowering. <laughs> yep. Sorry, that was me. Uh, sorry. Um, it's empowering as a business owner to, uh, which is what we are as an entrepreneur to put um, parameters around right. your time um, because it, it, you spin your wheels. And I love that you've you've kind of mentioned the marketing team, the virtual assistant, because we, we've been talking about that a little bit more lately, last few episodes, outsourcing the stuff you hate or you're not good at or that takes you forever because you're not excited about it. Like you're just going to spin your wheels. And yes, you have to invest some money to get a person who who's good at it, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're outsourcing. Yeah. But I always think like frust- time is money. Frustration is money. Uh, yeah. Lack of joy is money. So yes. put some money down. Yeah, you know, we, I, so my role at our school is as the admissions director here. So I talk to people who are interested in becoming health coaches and, and um, there's a lot of very thoughtful questions that come up in these conversations. And one that comes up all the time is about making a living doing this. What should I be charging people? What um, do health coaches do? What does that even look like day to day? And, you know, I always answer that question with another question about like, what, life do you want to have? Right. Because it would be a real shame if you quit the corporate gig, came in to start your own business that now just became another job and you have even less time and you're making less money. Like that doesn't make any sense. And when we get into kind of how you, you said you have an idea as to kind of what you need to make per hour, what you want to make, what you valued your time at, yeah. Um, it's important, I think, for a lot of coaches to think through this stuff, especially new coaches, because, um, you know, if you've determined, hey, I want to have weekends off, I don't want to work Wednesday night, and I want to be able to take X amount of time off. Now you've got limited hours, and you've got to figure out from a offering perspective and a value perspective what you're going to offer. And if your first answer is, well, who's going to pay me that? That's like a whole other problem. <laughs> right? We've got to start from someplace else to help increase your own confidence and your own sense of your value to be worth that to the end client and, and kind of solving for that problem. This is a difference in like an entrepreneurial mindset. And again, kind of going back to what do we need to do? What do you need to work on to try to remove that sense of imposter syndrome and, and really understand that, you, that you're worth it and that you're worthy of everything it is that you want and desire? And that you can do so much good for so many people doing it. You know, there's something that just came up for me that I want to say. And I, I know this over 20 some years of enrolling people in personal training programs, now coaching programs, is that people who pay, pay attention. Mm-hmm. Exactly. People who pay, pay attention. And would you like to know how much I charge for my coaching practice? I mean, would, I yeah. don't know if I should throw it out there or not. Yeah. yeah. They will come into a, a complimentary session with me 
and I call it a breakthrough session. And that's $350 value, which is where I value my hours, my time per hour, right? And if they decide to enroll right there and then I give them a discount, otherwise I charge $1,200 a month for my coaching. If they, if they enroll right there and then, then I give them a lot of different bonuses as well as a discount on the price, which is $8.95 a month. And if they pay in full for the year, I discount that by a couple of thousand dollars because when I find that when they commit for the year or even six months, if the year is too much, even six months, they're more invested than the people who just pay month to month. Mm -hmm. they're more invested. So this is what I have found. And this is through years of trial and error. And again, enrolling people in these large, large packages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how I do it. And it, you are worth it. So get over that imposter syndrome, do what we need to do. I don't you, I don't know if we want to touch on that subject again, because you are worth, you are worth it. You are worth it. And I, I'm not somebody to tell you how much you're worth per hour, but that's what I think I should be making 350 an hour. And I am, which is good. I like coming at it from that way. I, I had that little sort of um, Me too. Yeah. thought that process a few years ago, like what's my hour worth? And I, uh, you know, I think a lot of coaches orchestrate their programs differently. Maybe we can get into that a little bit, but for example, mine is an eight week program and mm -hmm. uh, it works out to just the way it works out timing wise. Every client in eight weeks gets five and a half hours of my time. Okay. And I priced that based on what I believed my hour is worth. And that is the price tag of my eight week program. It's, mm -hmm. I don't discount it. I don't negotiate on it. That's the price tag. And if it's not the right price tag for somebody, it's like, cool. It's gotta be a hell yes. If it's not the right price tag for you right now, that's okay. Um, I only wanna work with hell yeses and this is how much this thing costs. It's like, that's how much this thing costs. This thing had a price tag at the store and I paid for it. And that's how I kind of think about my, my coaching packages. It's like, I'm not gonna waffle on it. This is the this is the price of my time. Yeah. And I, I don't waffle on that discount either. If they don't take it right there and then, if they're not a hell yes, yep. then it's okay. I don't, I don't beat myself up any longer that, oh my gosh, I didn't enroll that person. I, I, I need to learn how to, how to enroll people better. I don't do that any longer. They simply weren't, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right place. I wasn't the right person for them. And I send them love. I send them joy and I send them on their way. Yes. So, yeah. I don't pursue them. Know. Some people fill out my application for the breakthrough session and then I answer them. Okay, great. You can, uh, you qualify. Here's my schedule. Go ahead and schedule yourself. They don't answer my call. They don't schedule. I, I don't pursue them. Yeah. Not, not the right time, not the right place. Do you mind sharing a little bit what's on that application? What kind of information are you looking for going into that initial hmm. breakthrough session to qualify somebody? Uh, now you have to be thinking about what it is. Uh, I ask them how long have they been uh, trying to lose weight? I'm pulling it up now, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. so that yeah. I can tell you the exact questions because I'm happy to share these. These are really good yeah. questions. And I'm waiting for that to come. Through. And while, while you're, while you're pulling it up though, I, I just think it's interesting to frame it as an application. Like we don't guys, we don't have to, we don't have to take every client that comes across our desk. Like no. the discovery process is just about as much about us feeling it's a good fit and yeah. wanting to work with that person. Yeah. So these are the questions that I ask. Yeah. Of course, their name, their email, their phone. What is your number one most important health goal you want to achieve over the next year? On a scale of one to 10, how important is it for you to achieve this goal over the next year? 10 being totally ready to get started, like a hell yes. And one not ready at all. Um, what stage are you in with your health? Most people are in one of the following stages and there's a whole bunch of things that they can check off. Um, hold on a second. Let me look at my drop down menu. I, uh, you want to be healthier and lose weight, but don't know where to start. Two, you're frustrated. You've lost weight, but can't keep it off. Or three, you're soaring and you want to know how to keep it off forever. Hmm. And then the next question is, what are your biggest challenges keeping you from achieving your most important health goal? Check all that apply. Just getting started. Do I matter? Breaking old habits, gassy, no energy, emotional eating. Nothing has worked. Ugh. Uh, I'm hard. It's hard to find time. I need the fastest way to lose weight. Can't fit into my clothes. I can't sleep. Will I ever be able to lose weight? I don't know how to cook. I don't like vegetables. Am I ever going to lose weight? I feel unsupported and alone, bloated. I'm exhausted all the time. 
you get that. Next question. <laughs> How long have you been struggling with these challenges? Next question. What have you tried in the past to overcome these challenges? What happened with those approaches? On a scale of one to 10, how important is it for you to overcome these biggest challenges starting to today to achieve your most important goal? On a scale of one to 10, how, how supportive is your spouse family with your health goals? How much change are you willing to make to improve your health? Minimal, some, or complete? And how did you find out about Tina McDermott? There you go. And that's it. That's my entire application. So are, are some of those like immediate red flags? Like, for example, I need to lose weight fast. If that came through on mine, I'd be like, we're not doing this. <laughs> but for you, do you have, are there some things where you, where you glance at the um, application, you're like, eh. and then if, it, if, it's a, if it's a no from you, even before speaking to the person, how do you handle that? You know, it's funny. <sighs> Yes, there's red flags. So you, you were, we've been working with people for a long time, right? I, I can tell that the two of you have been working with people for a long time. So you can kind of guess by their answers what, where they are and where, where they are. Like if they're sparse on their answers, you're like, oh, they're really not that vested. Mm -hmm. They're really not that vested. So I just, I literally ignore it. Or sometimes I'll just, I'll answer them back. Thank you very much for filling out the application. It's not a good fit for you right now. That's something I would say. Um, but if it's somebody who just like put one word answers on each of them, sometimes I won't even answer it. And I'm like, well, how did you even get a hold of my application? Mm -hmm. um, but if they look like a good fit, I'll email them back and say, you know, you thank you for filling out the application. You are absolutely a good fit. And I'm happy to offer you this um, finally thin forever uh, breakthrough coaching session. And this is what we do in the session. And here's the link, go ahead and get yourself scheduled. And if they don't schedule themselves, I might email them or call them one more time. And after that, I, um, I, there's abundance. There's so many more people out there. I literally have room for one more one-on-one -on -one client right now. That's it. That's all I want to take on. I want to enjoy the rest of my summer, basically. <laughs> you know, I want to have control over this. And mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how I handle that. That's how I handle those. Well, what I like about that is like, if I go to the bank and apply for a loan, I have mm -hmm. to take that application process seriously, or the bank's going to like laugh me out of there. And yeah, I think I like that. It's like, Hey, you just kind of stumbled across this. You filled it in for a laugh. You didn't put a lot of thought into it. When you're ready to be serious about this, I'm here. And that's, exactly. yeah. It's, it's oh, so no. fun. It's, it's, I just think, I guess the reason I use that bank analogy is like, let's coaches, we need to treat this. Like we need to understand that this is a real business and this, these applications are real. And, and we want our prospective clients to give a damn. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. I mean, the bank wouldn't let you get away with it. So neither should we. And, and I want to save you a ton of time in your life as a health coach. I have had people, I would just give them the breakthrough session without the application and they weren't ready. Right. They weren't ready. They had to answer those questions before they scheduled it, but it wasn't an application. It was, they were already in my scheduler and I'd end up wasting an hour, hour and a half of my time. And they'd be like, oh, I didn't know what this was all about. And oh yeah, no, this isn't for me. I'm like, okay. But now I don't waste my time doing my free sessions with people who aren't ready. The application qualifies them and it gets them ready. And if don't pursue them more than one or two calls, that's it. They're not ready and don't waste right. your time. Anyhow. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of new coaches kind of, I think sometimes you just need to learn it the hard way that you, you bring on yeah. or you say yes to somebody that, you know, like you just don't have a great feeling about it, but you're new and you just want to get a client under your belt. You want to get paid, earn some money. So you bring somebody on and then lo and behold, <laughs> like you're kicking yourself. Yep. You're like, I knew it from the beginning. You know, once you've had one or two clients that either aren't responsive or trying to nickel and dime you and are asking you to lower your prices or are argumentative, mm -hmm. um, or, or insist, you know, there's, you'll know what client, you know, coaches listening, you'll know what we mean when you see it, um, that it's, it's not worth it. 
it, it's just not worth it. The angst involved, the stress of going into a session with a with a, a client that you just know it's not working. And then the next thing you know, your client's like, I want my money back because this isn't working. When you knew from the beginning, it probably wouldn't in the beginning. And why put yourself through that? But sometimes you kind of have to learn things the hard way, you know, as far as that goes. So I, I love the idea of more of an application process because if, if someone's not willing to fill it out thoughtfully from the beginning, that right there is your first red flag. First red flag. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely love it. So I know that we're going to have a lot of people that I think are going to be fascinated about what you're doing and want to know more about what you're doing. Yeah. So would you mind telling us kind of where, where can people find you? What's the best place like your website, any social media things that they should kind of take a look at? Where can people connect with you? Uh, Simple. TinaMcDermott.com. And uh, if you want to find me on Facebook, you'll find me under tinamcdermott.com. And my free support group is called um, Tina's Joyful Kitchen. No, it's the Joyful Gut. That's what it's called. Sorry, I get confused with everything I've got going on. Uh, The Joyful Gut, you can find me on Facebook. If you want to be on my YouTube channel, it's uh, Tina's Joyful Kitchen. Go to YouTube and it's Tina's Joyful Kitchen. And you'll find me there and you can subscribe. Please subscribe. I'm trying to, we just started this channel. So I'm trying to get a lot of subscribers. Awesome. And yeah. And you can watch my cooking shows. I do little tidbits of stuff. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And I hope that you join me on my, if you do anything, join me on my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel. Perfect. Well, it was a joy chatting with you, Tina. I love, we love, as you said, at the beginning of this episode, we love talking to coaches who have built a practice everyone's is so unique and it's just so interesting to hear every 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 coach's little little mm-hmm. piece of the coaching sphere so thank you for sharing it with us yeah, i thank love you. it congratulations on your success and thanks for sharing a piece of it with us we love yeah it. you're so 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 welcome laura and aaron thank you very much for having me on the show and i really truly um, hope that this has inspired your listeners to if you're there are not already health coaches to be health coaches and if you are a health coach you can be, there's abundance out there for you. And the last thing I want to leave people with is that we're here, we are here on this earth for joy. We're here on this earth for joy. And if you're not in joy, move towards joy, move towards it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show, ladies. Awesome. Thank you for that. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 Certification Course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach Certification Course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing, 
and the nuances of habit change, goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's Level 2 program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level 2. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844 307 seven six six two thank you for listening to health coach radio and i hope i get to talk to you soon